Uh, hi everyone, my name is Huda Said, and today I'm going to be focusing on a research paper titled Nanomedicine-Based Immunotherapy for Central Nervous System Disorders. Um, and basically in this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on three different disorders. There's glioblastoma, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's. And I'm going to be talking about the new forms of immunotherapy treatment that incorporate nanomedicine. So before I talk about the actual paper, I wanted to start off with some background information, what nanomedicine is and what immunotherapy is. So nanomedicine is basically uh, the use of nanotechnology in medicine with the purpose of either preventing or treating the disease. Now, first time I heard about nanomedicine, I was thinking of something like <laughs> the top picture, which is kind of funny. But just because it has technology in it, that doesn't mean it's limited to robots or machinery. It can actually um, take the form of vaccines or nanoparticles that replicate organic parts of our body. And so what exactly is immunotherapy? It's a commonly used as a form of cancer treatment and immunotherapy utilizes um, our body's own immune system in order to treat a disease. And this is done by uh, genetically engineering specific cells that can either activate or suppress an immune response. Okay, so why exactly would we even need to incorporate nanomedicine into immunotherapy treatments? Isn't that enough? Well, there are some problems with current immunotherapy treatments that are hard to figure out. One of the biggest ones is the fact that our central nervous immune system works, but it works a little too well. So I know you guys are thinking like, what the heck is she talking about? <laughs> so basically uh, the environment of our central nervous system is very adaptive and distinct through the existence of different things like uh, glial cells. So in this diagram here, uh, the main way that drugs and particles transport themselves throughout the body is through our blood vessels. And so if you look at a normal blood vessel compared to the brain blood vessels, you can see that the brain one has this barrier around it composed of glial brain cells. So glial brain cells uh, are composed of uh, microglia and macrophages, which are basically immune uh, defense cells for the brain. And then with this barrier, it makes it incredibly difficult for things to get in and out of the brain. So even if a treatment is effective, if it can't even get to the site of the disease, it's basically useless. So for this specific paper, um, uh, the experimenters basically test their nanomedicine on mice that either have glioblastoma, Alzheimer's, or Parkinson's. And so for each disease, they perform a different type of immunotherapy on the mouse that, that presents the symptoms and then they record their progression of the disease after each therapy. Okay, so the first disease that they focus on in this paper is glioblastoma. Um, glioblastoma is basically another name for a brain tumor, and it can be malignant. It can spread throughout the body, um, through the spine, and uh, the main cause for this disorder is still unknown. But like other cancers, it's believed that the mutations in genes that affect the cell's ability to control its replication could be the underlying cause. So um, normally the location of a tumor in the brain usually associates, um, usually correlates with what as symptoms occur, but um, the most frequent ones include headaches, seizures, and nausea. And like most other cancers and tumors, the current treatment includes uh, surgery. So if the tumor hasn't spread too far enough throughout the body, they can simply remove it through surgery. And there's also chemotherapy and radiation therapy. But uh, these treatments come with difficulties, including lack of specificity. So I'll go deeper into that when I actually talk about the treatments they used, but that's the main problem that nanomedicine is trying to solve in this paper. So the first treatment that they used for glioblastoma is chemoimmunotherapy. So chemotherapy is used to destroy any infected cells from a tumor or cancer. 
But because of how unspecific it is with what cells are targeted, some normal cells may get damaged in the process. So that's why anytime you see someone who is undergoing chemotherapy, a main symptom you see is their hair falling out. And oftentimes they seem very weak or they get tired easily. And that's because all of their cells are being attacked at once and their normal cells are being weakened. So for this treatment, they made something called a lipid nanocapsule cargo system. And it was basically a way to provide a clear path to the site of the tumor when the treatment was injected. And this cargo system contained the uh, chemotherapy drug and an immunostimulant to the site of the tumor. And then I also mentioned earlier how the blood brain barrier has a very strong defense. So in order to combat that, they developed these uh, nano discs, which are supposed to mimic tumor antigens so that the drug can pass along the cargo system without the brain uh, destroying it. It's almost like a way of like tricking the brain into thinking that, that those, uh, those uh, drugs and immunostimulants belong there. The brain is gonna think like, oh, this looks like an antigen, so I'll let it pass. That's basically what it's intended to do. And as a result, combining these things together, there was an increased survival rate in the mice that had these tumors. So the next treatment for glioblastoma was photoimmunotherapy. Photoimmunotherapy is basically when they use infrared light or, or near infrared light to develop antibodies that bind to the cancer cells. And so when these antibodies bind to the cells, it triggers the cancer cells to undergo apoptosis, um, and then it destroys them. So before, with chemotherapy, I said one of the main problems is that normal cells can be damaged or destroyed. And so the purpose of applying nanomedicine to this treatment is to be more selective with the cells that are attacked. They didn't go into a lot of detail about uh, what they actually did for this treatment, but they mentioned something called a photosensitizer, which they said was supposed to trigger an anti-tumor immune response. So they were supposed to call more immune cells like those microglial cells to the site of the tumor. And it was also supposed to help communicate with those cells to tell them like, only destroy these cells, don't destroy these normal cells and damage this body. And overall, the treatment didn't really stop the progression of the tumor but they found it was very effective with communicating with these immune cells. And the last treatment for glioblastoma was gene immunotherapy. So before I mentioned that tumors could be caused by genetic mutations that can um, inhibit the control of cell growth. And so the purpose of immunotherapy is to identify the specific genes that are responsible for the mutation. And so for this experiment, they injected the mice with this non-replicating adenovirus that can basically go in and tell the gene to, uh, like tell the gene, like these cells are growing really rapidly. You need to stop this because it's causing a tumor. <laughs> and so uh, along with this, they also developed a nanoparticle that contained a uh, cyclic peptide, which is another thing that can sort of trick the brain so that the adenovirus can actually cross the blood brain barrier. And as a result, there was a significant increase in the number of mice that survived. According to the paper, it said that the survival rate went from 30 to 50% to about 88%. And I think that out of all three treatments that were for glioblastoma, this one was the most successful. So the second disease that was covered in this paper was Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is caused by these amyloid beta peptides. And these amyloid peptides, they end up forming these plaques, which also leads to um, the formation of these neurofibrillary tangles inside the neurons. And so when these tangles form, it makes it very hard for an electrical signal to pass from one neuron to the other. And this results in the symptoms of Alzheimer's, including memory loss, or in very severe cases, um, function impairment and language deterioration. So the current treatments include drugs that act as either inhibitors or antagonists that can lessen the symptoms, but unfortunately they cannot stop the progression of the disease. So that's 
the application that they're trying to combat with the neuromedicine in this case. So for this treatment, the experimenters used passive immunotherapy. There's also active immunotherapy, which is basically using the patient's own antibodies to combat the disease. But passive is when they directly inject the antibodies into the person. So uh, since it was that buildup of those amyloid plaques that led to the damaged neurons that caused Alzheimer's, uh, the specific treatment focused on the antibodies um, to increase the brain's immune system response by re releasing more of those microglial cells that can destroy those plaques. And so as a result, after taking that treatment, they found that uh, there was an increase in microglia activity, which showed that there was a boost in the immune response. And there was a reduced number of those plaques, which showed that they um, progressed in trying to stop the disease at least a little bit. So the last disease that they covered in this paper was Parkinson's disease. And this is when there is a loss of nerve cell function in the, a part of the brain called the substantinia nigra and uh, the alpha synuclein protein. So this specific protein is supposed to regulate the, the neurotransmitter release in the brain. And so when this protein is damaged, it makes the body, it makes it difficult for the body to produce enough do dopamine. And the uh, substantinia nigra and dopamine those two are both responsible for motor movement. And so the symptoms of Parkinson's includes the loss of motor function like shaking and stiffness. And some of the current treatments include different types of drugs and deep brain stimulation that are intended to try to, um, try to bring some of that motor function back. But like Alzheimer's, it doesn't slow the progression, it only lessens the symptoms. So that's what the nanomedicine in this case is also trying to combat. So as I mentioned, there's that alpha synuclein that gets damaged, and that's what's causing all of this mess. And so when it gets damaged, uh, what's left is this little particle called a Lewy body, which ultimately leads to the nerve cells dying. So the purpose of this treatment, um, what they did is they injected these monoclonal antibodies. And these antibodies are supposed to bind to that protein to try to repair it before it becomes a Lewy body and kills the nerve cell. And in addition to this, it's also supposed to trigger an immune response to bring more of those, those microglial cells I mentioned to aid in the repair of the protein. So uh, they performed this treatment over the course of about seven days with the mice that had Parkinson's. And as a result of, the, of this treatment, they found that there was a reduced amount of Lewy bodies that formed so more of, the, of those alpha synuclein proteins were repaired. And there was a decrease in neuron dysfunction. So not as many neurons uh, died in this case. And in some mice, uh, the treatment stopped the Lewy bodies forming completely, which showed that it stopped the progression of the disease. So overall, uh, neurological disorders can be very difficult to treat. Uh, they can be a combination of genetic factors, environmental factors, both. There can be a new variant of the disease for each patient that is diagnosed with it. So I think uh, neuromed nanomedicine, sorry, being incorporated into immunotherapy, it can really help us better use the person's immune system as a way to treat the disease. And so by doing that, the diseases can be better targeted and it will actually slow or stop the progression. And that concludes my presentation. Hey, Hoto, uh, that was a really good presentation. Um, I just wanted to know why you were so interested in neurological diseases. Oh, neurological diseases. Yeah, that's actually my uh, biology concentration. Um, and I really got into it um, like senior year of high school when I had to make a presentation about Alzheimer's. And I thought it was interesting learning about neurological diseases because usually for most diseases, um, 
like the root of the cause also usually involves the brain and involves some sort of uh, problem with the brain not being able to allow the mechanism to function properly. And so I think that's why I usually focus on neurological things. <laughs> Um, in the chat, Samuel asked when this research article was from. When was this research article from? Uh, let me actually see. Uh, this is the research article. Uh, I believe it was published in Nature, and that's the, I believe that's the company that made it. And as for the year, I think it was recent, uh, 2020, right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this stuff is pretty recent. Hopefully it'll actually be used in practice soon, if perfected. Yeah, hopefully. I wanted to ask, do you think uh, immunotherapy is sort of gonna be like the, the future of medical treatment? Immunotherapy, how? Ooh, that's a good question. I think maybe it will be because with immunotherapy, um, you're utilizing the patient's own immune system. And so, like I said, um, a lot of the times with diseases, we're not sure if it's, uh, if everyone is, if the cause is the same for everyone or if it's a new variant for each person. And so with immunotherapy, you're sort of getting a personalized treatment. So I think it will become more popular in medicine eventually. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely agree. I think from like what I've seen of like a lot of like modern medical research articles, they're looking at like immunotherapy and sort of like hol more holistic treatments rather than like and and trying to move away from like invasive surgery and uh, like heavy medication as as treatment plans. Yeah, that's true. Do we have any more questions for Oda? Yeah, I have one. Um, you said, I, th I can't remember the, which treatment it was, but you said it was the most effective of the immunotherapies. Could you go back and talk more about that, if you don't mind? Oh yeah, let me see. I believe that was the gene immunotherapy. Yeah, yeah, the gene immunotherapy. Yeah. Um, it didn't go into detail about why that was most effective, but I would assume that in my personal opinion, um, so like the main reason a tumor usually starts is the fact that there's an uncontrolled growth of cells and they're not able to stop it. So I think with the gene therapy, they were able to pinpoint, pinpoint which gene caused that uncontrolled growth and stop it. So I think that's why it was the most effective. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that that explains it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any more questions? All right. Well, thanks a lot, Huda, for presenting. And I'm just going to play the video here for Garam's presentation. Hi, my name is Corinne. I'm a first year student double majoring in chemistry and communication. 
Um, and for this, I decided to look into a research paper on palladium catalyzed alkene chain running isomerization. And I developed this review presentation based on that paper. So basically to summarize, the researchers report a method of alkene isomerization that utilizes a phenanthylene palladium complex to produce siloenol ethers. I know that sounds pretty complicated. So I'm gonna start out with some definitions so that this is a little easier to understand. So first off, we have isomers, which are basically chemical compounds that have the same molecular formulas, but different spatial and structural arrangements of atoms. So um, isomerization reactions look at how we can chemically transform between two different isomers, if that makes sense. Um, next up, we have alkenes. And simply put, alkenes have a carbon-carbon double bond. Um, and the last term I want to define is chain running, which is also known as chain walking or chain migration. Um, chain running usually occurs when some catalyst, which is usually a transition metal catalyst, allows a group on a carbon to move um, a group on a carbon chain to move from a terminal end to an internal position. So in this case, and I guess kind of to just summarize the research, we are going to be looking at transforming terminal alkenes to favorable internal alkenes and focus on why that is important. So I guess kind of on that note, why, why is this research important? So alkenes serve as key intermediates in complex multi-step organic syntheses. And we want to find ways to get to those intermediate stages and move past them in the most effective and cost-efficient ways. So we're looking at feasibilities. So specifically, we want to find ways to isomerize readily available alkenes into more desirable but less accessible alkenes. Um, and there's a lot of factors that really play into this, including the fact that isomerization often results in multiple products based on stability and thermodynamics. And the main question is, can we control that? And the answer is yes and no. So chemists can develop mechanisms that are regioselective, meaning that the desired reaction occurs favorably at a specific location on the compound. And chemists can also develop mechanisms that favor one isomer over another. So you would get a ratio of products and would have to use further lab techniques to identify that ratio. And I guess kind of building on that, if you look at the image on the top right, we have two different drawings of 2-butene, which is a chemical compound. Um, and they have the same molecular formula, but they're technically not the same compound because the trans 2-butene is actually more energetically favorable because in this case, there's less steric hindrance as the bulkier functional groups are on opposite sides of the compound in comparison to cis-2-butene. So with this in mind, the next question is what research already exists surrounding this topic? So researchers have already found various techniques for chain running alkene isomerization. So what makes this new mechanism so unique? Um, and the first thing is that we actually get an alkene. So in other similar reactions, the ending products are ketones or aldehydes, which are different functional groups because they are more thermodynamically favored than alkenes. And then secondly, the new mechanism works well with both straight and branch substrates, which you can see in the bottom right image. Um, so this is where, so to summarize, like this is where we're at right now. So the research I looked into displays a mechanism that isomerizes terminal alkenes to internal alkenes and works with branch substrates. Okay, so now let's actually get into the mechanism. And I know this looks a little technical and complicated, but bear with me. So Dr. Kosin, who's a professor at the University of Houston, and his team developed this reaction scheme. Um, so I'll talk about each of the different things that are on here. So first, the reactant is a branch substrate with a terminal alkene and a methyl group in the second position. And what the scheme does is move the terminal alkene to an internal position so that we get a siloenol ether, which you can see there. Um, and that name actually makes more sense in this context because um, OTBS stands for an oxygen attached to a tri-substituted silicon atom, and hence the term silo, which is actually a portmanteau of silicon and alo. And this product is an enol because we end up with a carbon-carbon double bond attached directly to an oxygen atom, and the term ether fits as well because we have an oxygen atom bonded essentially um, to two carbon atoms because silicon is underneath carbon on the periodic table and behaves somewhat similarly. And this squiggly line like in the product basically means that this reaction works regardless of the length of the carbon chain. Um, so we go from a terminal alkene to an internal alkene and a silo you know, ether, but like what actually allows this? Like, so what are some of the conditions and catalysts? So first from underneath the reaction arrow, we can see that the reaction takes place in deuterated chloroform and it also works in chloroform or dichloromethane at room temperature or below. And on top of the reaction arrow, we see the catalyst which is the 2,9-dimethylphenanthylene palladium methyl chloride complex. And that's definitely a mouthful. And I'll talk a little bit about how that catalyst was selected and why it works. Um, the catalyst is activated by NABAR4, which is shown here um, on the right. And uh, the activator is a cyclical compound that lends stability and reactivity to the catalyst. So the activator-catalyst pair is what really um, allows this reaction to proceed. 
Um, so the scheme is definitely a lot and there's a lot of different things that play into it and um, provide context. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those things. So first off, how was the catalyst selected? So for starters, palladium is an effective catalyst for the dehydrogenation of substituted carbon chains. Um, and it's also a transition metal. And as I mentioned before, transition metal catalysts are often used in these types of chain running isomerization reactions. And paired with the activator, the catalyst is also quite bulky, which helps with regioselectivity. So it'll only react at a specific place on like our um, reactant. Um, but to get a little bit more specific, phenanthylene palladium alkyl um, cations follow a mechanism similar to the steps of alkene isomerization. So the mechanism includes a series of beta hydride eliminations and reinsertions, which in theory also occurs during chain migration. So from just like theory and past research, Kosin and his team were able to deduce that a phenanthylene palladium complex would be the most useful. And from the compound shown, that makes up for everything but the attached chloride and methyl groups. Um, so through an optimization study, the team found that the selected catalyst works best alongside the cyclical activator, which is a variant of sodium tetraphenyl borate, which is a well-known precipitating agent in organic chemistry. Um, the catalyst is also air and moisture stable, which makes running the reaction a lot easier in terms of like monitoring conditions and stuff. So to kind of build off of the last side, the next thing we should look at is why this reaction works. So how does it proceed? So for all of the chemistry people, the full mechanism is quite complicated, but note that the catalyst exhibits the behavior of an unstable electrophile, which allows for efficient and selective coordination. So to summarize, the palladium ends up as a cationic species that coordinates the substrate and a series of migratory insertions and beta hydride eliminations allow the mechanism to proceed. And this makes sense given what we know about phenanthylene palladium alkyl cations from the previous slide. So the image on the right side of this slide shows how beta hydride eliminations work. And you can see that you end up with an alkene. So pretty much the insertion part gets you to A and the elimination gets you to B, which allows for chain running to happen. Okay, so going back to what the reaction scheme tells us, we see a terminal alkene transformed to an internal alkene in a siloenol ether. But why are siloenol ethers so important? Basically, they're desirable intermediates in organic synthesis, and they serve as neutral nucleophiles that react with good electrophiles like carbocations and aldehydes. Siloenol ethers also allow for carbon-carbon bond formation in several reactions. So now that we know a little bit more about the general reaction scheme itself in relation to siloenol ethers, we can dive into some of the other results from like the research itself. So the scheme actually works for a variety of alkenes, and the researchers were able to find the following. Um, various simple alkenes can be effectively isomerized using the catalyst and activator duo, which is shown in the first scheme. Um, and under the same conditions, silyl alyl ethers can be isomerized to their corresponding enol you know, silanes, which is shown in scheme two. Um, additionally, as shown in scheme three, long distance chain running isomerization works well too, resulting in ketone and aldehyde, and aldehyde silyl enol ethers, as discussed earlier, and dye substituted enols. And these products are very useful in organic synthesis. Um, of course, the research article itself contains a number of tables that specify reactants and resulting products based on the general schemes one through three, but I don't think we need to go through all of them as the reaction diagrams require, um, as these like diagrams display everything that um, is summarized in the tables, basically. Um, and another important note is that each of the schemes shown on the slide have good yields with easy isomer selectivity, meaning that the, re the researchers found the ratios of different isomers in product. Um, and this information would be useful if you want to design a reaction scheme that needs a specific isomer of a compound. Um, and furthermore, the scheme works well with low catalyst loadings and gram scale reactions and has high turnover numbers. So to summarize all of that, basically the catalyst activator mechanism is both effective and versatile, and you can, we can see its usefulness in terms of organic synthesis here. Um, so you've probably noticed I haven't talked about reactive scheme four yet, and that's because it deals with the synthesis of fluorinated siloenol ethers. So what, what is that, what are they, and why are they important? So fluorinated enol ethers follow the structure shown in this image. So in our case, X would be a silicon so that we get fluorinated silo enol ethers. But why do these compounds actually matter? So there's actually an entire 30 page review paper dedicated to the synthesis and reactivity of fluorinated enol ethers. So clearly they're important and here's the reason why. So in recent years, more and more marketed drugs tend to incorporate a fluorine atom into their structure because it enhances the pharmacokinetic properties of such compounds. So the synthesis of fluorinated organic molecules, like the one shown in scheme four from the last slide, um, has become an incredibly active research field. And not surprisingly, fluorinated siloenol ethers are a very valuable intermediate in organic synthesis. 
So coming back to the actual scheme, we can see that Kosin and his team were able to use the catalyst and activator, as well as an additional silane activator to transform an alkenyl fluoride to a fluorinated silyl phenol ether with good yield and easy selectivity. And this is shown in the isomerization of four to five, basically, um, in the right side image. Um, and oh, talking about um, the, the one on the bottom right, so from the right side image to the bottom one, um, the isomerization of six to seven shows the production of a fluoromethyl substituted enol ether as well. So with that, I'll wrap up everything that I've talked about so far. So um, it was definitely a lot to try and understand. Um, I'm sure my, my chemistry people definitely have a better understanding, but um, here are some of just the main takeaways from the research. So isomerization of terminal alkenes to internal alkenes yields favorable products for complex organic syntheses. A. Um, so Kosin and his team, so Kosin et al, were able to use their mechanism, which consists of a 2,9 dimethyl phenanthylene palladium methyl chloride complex paired with an activator to isomerize simple alkenes and siloalol ethers. The method also works for long distance chain running isomerization and the synthesis of fluorinated siloenol ethers. So that's basically what we saw in this presentation and what I was able to deduce from their research paper. Um, so these are my references. Um, the first one obviously is the paper itself. And the next one is that 30 page paper I talked about, about fluorinated enol ethers. Um, and that's it. Thank you guys for listening to me talk about chemistry related things. Um, and let me know if you have any questions or comments. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't be there today because I have a different event to be at, but I'd be happy if you guys want to reach out to ask me any questions. And I can also connect you guys to other um, references and resources related to the topic. So that's it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, it's the end of his video. I think it was a very good presentation. Definitely something you need a chemistry background for. Uh, I was trying to remember a lot of the organic chemistry stuff for that. Um, if you have any questions for him, or you just want to like ask him about stuff, <laughs> yeah, it was intense. Um, I'm dropping his email address in the chat. So if anybody has questions for him, or you know, just wants to talk about research or whatever with him, feel free to do so. Um, but if you guys have any questions for me uh let me know otherwise i think we're gonna wrap up this yeah definitely trying to remember the orgo stuff um all right so thanks everybody for coming uh this was our last meeting of the semester of the year um hopefully we're gonna try to kick off like a summer mentorship program uh, we'll definitely send out emails for that because I think the winter one went really well. So keep keep looking at your emails and good luck with finals, everybody. And thank you for coming. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. You too.